Hello, it's Dr. Fors Kazazi, and welcome to the fourth and final part of Embryology Made Easy, a crash course for medical students. Today, we'll be discussing the organogenesis of endoderm-derived tissue, specifically the gut tube and the HPB systems. You'll recall this diagram from part three and the importance of knowing the derivatives of the primary germ layers. Today, we'll be focusing on the endoderm, specifically the formation of the GI tract, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, and the lungs. The GI tract can be divided into the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut, starting at the oropharyngeal membrane at the mouth and finishing in the cloacal membrane at the anus. This gut is a tube of endoderm that forms from the ventral layer of the trilaminar disc following folding. Originally, it is surrounded by a layer of mesoderm, but this disperses, leaving behind the dorsal mesentery. This mesentery plays a key role in transporting the vessels to and from the organs. It also allows the organs to be suspended in the abdominal cavity as we walk and go about our daily activities. Very commonly assessed is the understanding of, is medical students' understanding of retroperitoneal organs. So one can consider these as primary or secondary. Primary retroperitoneal organs are those that form totally outside of the peritoneum. And secondary retroperitoneal organs are those which initially form intraperitoneally, but due to movements and rotations that we'll later discuss, end up in a retroperitoneal position. I cannot stress how commonly assessed this small factoid is. The three divisions of the gut were initially thought to be demarcated and derived due to the arteries that supply them. These branches of the aorta are the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric arteries. Again, this is very commonly assessed in exams as you will be asked to outline the vascular supply of a structure within the adult body. Now, through latest understanding, we recognize that the division of the gut into these three segments is actually determined by expression of Hox genes. These are sequential genes which, through a layered approach of expression, will define different parts of the body from the cranial to the caudal end. Starting most cranially in the GI tube, the lungs will bud from the foregut and branching of this lung bud will lead to the formation of the alveoli and the complex lo lobular structure that we see in the adult. This is also why laryngeotracheal sinuses and fistulas can occur due to incomplete budding or issues with the budding of the trachea from the esophagus. This may be seen through a trachea a tracheo esophageal fistula that will present through aspiration of milk in the newborn. It will cough when it attempts to take milk from the breast and it may regurgitate or vomit more than typically expected. The diaphragm, as we discussed it during the session on folding, formed from the septum transversum. It has additional contributions from the pleuroperitoneal membranes and also the dorsal mesentery. The key function of forming the diaphragm is not just through its respiratory and ventilatory role, but actually through the separation of the axial skeleton and the torso into two separate cavities, the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. This allows the creation of different pressure generating cavities, each becoming more suitable to its function. For example, the negative pressures that can be generated in the thoracic cavity do not affect the abdominal cavity, but allow for ventilation. Furthermore, within the abdominal cavity, a slightly positive pressure means that during a trauma, for example, or a penetrating injury, the omentum, sometimes described as the policeman of the abdomen, can cover any hole 
that is produced through the penetrating injury in order to reduce the spread of infection and bleeding. The separation into a thoracic and abdominal cavity also means that an injury or infection in one area does not detriment the organ function in the other. Moving more cordially, the formation of the stomach is a key process to understand. So the dorsal mesentery discussed earlier is coupled with a ventral mesentery that will thin. The thoracic foregut begins to elongate rapidly to create a distance between the mouth and the presumptive stomach area. This will form our esophagus. Expansion of the foregut caudal to the septum transversum leads to this spindle-shaped GI tube. This will begin to rotate and grow. Differential growth uh, will lead to the formation of this greater curvature. Expansion superior to the greater curvature creates a fundus and a cardiac incisura. Here you can see how asymmetric cellular development leads to the formation of the mature stomach shape as we know it. Now the rotation occurs because of this ventral thinning, ventral mesentery thinning, and a 90 degree rotation around the craniocaudal axes occurs such that the greater curvature lies to the left. This means that the right left vagal plexi will rotate to become the posterior and anterior vagal plexuses. This used to be very important anatomy due to the now historic surgical procedure of removal of the vagal plexuses. This was very important as patients that suffered with severe acid reflux or dysphagia would need to undergo this procedure to reduce the amount of acid secretion in the stomach. This was such a key procedure that if you ask some more senior doctors what they believe to be the most revolutionary development of modern medicine. Some will argue that it's actually proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole and lanzoprazole as they by and large reduce the requirement at all to do the surgical procedure. Around day 22, a small endodermal thickening in the presumptive ventral duodenal area will form. This is more caudal, obviously, to the stomach that has just formed but exists as a hepatic plate. This will proliferate to become the hepatic diverticulum. Now, a diverticulum is true if it contains all three layers or all layers of whatever structure that it is an outpouching from. A pseudo-diverticular, such as that in mature diverticular disease or in a pseudo-aneurysm, doesn't contain all the layers um, of the structure that is herniating. So this hepatic diverticulum will grow into the septum transversum and it will form hepatoblasts that will become the hepatocytes, the bile canaliculi and the hepatic ducts. However, the supporting stroma of the liver will develop from the septum transversum and the surrounding mesoderm. You recall in the last session when we discussed formation of the linear heart tube the blood begins to circulate around day 24. This coincides with the formation of the liver as it generates the first blood cells, the erythroblasts, for the fetus. As such, the liver is actually the first hematopoietic organ of the embryo and not the bone marrow. Caudal to the hepatic diverticulum around day 26, but remaining on the ventral surface of this GI tube the cystic diverticulum will begin to grow. This will form the gallbladder and its cystic duct. And the common bile duct will form as a result of both the cystic diverticular and the hepatic diverticular. However, it's important to remember that the liver and the gallbladder actually form from embryologically distinct cells on the ventral duodenum. And this can be proved through radio labeling experiments. Slightly more caudal to the cystic diverticulum, a ventral pancreatic bud forms. And opposite to our hepatic diverticulum, on the contralateral surface, 
a dorsal pancreatic bud also begins to form. Now this dorsal bud is going to grow into our mesentery and elongate to join with the ventral, uh, dorsal, the ventral pancreatic bud late in the sixth week. When one looks at the microarchitecture of the pancreas, the round, circular, repetitive um, structures would make one think that it may occur due to budding of these buds. However, it actually forms these structures through the coalescence of microlumens and some resultant apoptosis. In the mature adult pancreas, the ventral pancreatic bud is going to form the huck-like unconate process, while the dorsal bud forms the head, body and tail. Again, this is commonly assessed, particularly in anatomy steeplechase exams. When the two buds fuse, the ducts will, a, a main duct needs to be determined, and this is typically that of the ventral bud. However, sometimes the, an annular pancreas or accessory duct can form. An annular pancreas occurs due to the growth of a bifid ventral pancreatic bud. Therefore, as these ventral and dorsal buds grow towards each other, it occurs at a quicker rate than one would typically expect as there is a shorter distance between the ventral buds and the dorsal buds. These fuse early and begin to mature, leading to a constricting ring around the duodenum. As such, patients will present with symptoms of gastric outflow, obstruction, such as vomiting or nausea. An accessory duct forms when the fusion of the ventral and dorsal buds is incomplete and the dorsal bud ducts do not obliterate. Biliary atresia is very important to recognise and is an important cause of neonatal jaundice beyond the first 24 hours of childbirth. The ducts are abnormally narrow, blocked or absent and it needs to be recognised rapidly as treatment is needed early before the condition threatens the life of the baby. Now, when recognised, a baby will typically undergo a procedure known as a Kasai surgical procedure. This opens up the narrowing of the bile ducts. However, this procedure is only successful in up to two-thirds of cases and as a result, it needs to be performed relatively early in order to recognise its success or failure, as babies in which the Kasai procedure is not successful need to undergo a liver transplant. Moving on to the midgut. The midgut describes the re portion of the gut that extends from the terminal ileum to two-thirds along the way of the transverse colon. It begins to develop around the fifth week where the presumptive ileum grows at a much greater rate than the abdominal cavity. In doing so, it forms a primary intestinal loop. This primary intestinal loop contains a cranial limb that has most of the ileum and a caudal limb that contains the transverse and ascending colon. The apex, the corner of this hairpin, is attached to the umbilicus by a vitelline duct. As such, the cranial limb can be seen to represent the remainder of the small bowel and the caudal limb can be seen to represent the large bowel. Now, as described, this midgut is growing at a faster pace than the surrounding abdominal cavity and as such herniates through its connection to the umbilicus. In doing so, it then rotates around an axis of the superior mesenteric artery that runs through the fold of this primary intestinal loop. It does so 90 degrees in a counterclockwise manner, such that the cranial limb now sits on the right and the caudal limb sits on the left. However, as we know from the adult anatomy, the ascending colon is not on the left side, and as such further rotations will occur. This happens after there is an increase in the length to form jejunal loops and the worm-like appendix. Now, as this midgut begins to retract into the abdomen, 
the additional 180 degree counterclockwise rotation occurs, leading to a total rotation of 270 degrees counterclockwise. Again, the rotation of the midgut is commonly assessed as a quick way to differentiate between medical school candidates. However, this process of retraction is not well understood. It is not known if the growth of the abdominal cavity catches up to that of the midgut or if there is an active retraction that is occurring. The, the pathologies that occur as a result of issues with this rotation include a left-sided colon, whereby the 180 degree rotation does not occur and the ascending colon remains on the left, or a reversed rotation where instead of a counterclockwise turn, a 180 degree clockwise turn happens. In this case, the organs are correctly positioned in the right left axis, but in the dorsal ventral axis, there is misaligning of the duodenum and the transverse colon, again leading to gastric outflow obstructive symptoms. Very important clinically is the Meckel's diverticulum. Now, this is often this is described to medical students because of its importance in differentials for patients presenting to accident and emergency. As patients present with symptoms in keeping with appendicitis, the differential should always include Meckel's diverticulum. For those students that haven't yet covered clinical medicine, patients with appendicitis will present with central abdominal pain that migrates to the right iliac fossa. This reflects the embryological origin of the inflamed tissue. As the body cannot differentiate that the appendix is the inflamed tissue, the pain is referred to the central abdomen. However, as the appendix becomes more inflamed and makes contact with the abdominal cavity, the pain migrates as it localizes to the right iliac fossa. This process can also occur with the Meckel's diverticulum. As this, as this is a midgut structure, the initial pain is referred to the central abdomen, and as it becomes more inflamed and makes contact with the abdominal cavity, the pain migrates to the right iliac fossa. Meckel's diverticulum can be remembered through the useful rule of twos, as it occurs in 2% of the population, lies 2 feet proximal to the ileocecal valve, typically measures 2 inches in length, presents most commonly at the age of 2, and has a 2 to 1 male to female preponderance ratio. Now, typically the Meckel's diverticulum will contain either gastric or pancreatic tissue. This can be seen through an 89 technetium scan, 98 even, a 98 technetium scan, whereby gastric tissue is radio labeled and when patients undergo this scan, you'll see the uh, uptake of the, um, of the labeling ion in the stomach area, and then ectopic labeling in the right iliac fossa. Pathologies with the herniation, retraction, and rotation can also present through omphaloceles, gastroschisis, and umbilical hernias. An omphalocele is herniation of the bowel covered by a thin avascular membrane. Gastrochysis is this herniation but without a covering sac. Note, however, the difference between gastrochysis and an umbilical hernia. Gastrochysis protrudes through the rectus muscle, not the umbilicus, and typically on the right side, whereas an umbilical hernia is normally a small, skin covered protrusion of bowel through the umbilicus. When one considers the surgical management of hernias, you need to understand why hernias can be a problem. Now, a hernia will protrude through an orifice, and if that orifice is too narrow, then the herniated tissue can be strangulated. When it becomes strangulated, it doesn't receive enough oxygen supply and, become, and can become ischemic and necrotic. As a result, a strangulated or irreducible hernia needs removing surgically. However, with umbilical hernias, typically the umbilicus is quite a large orifice, and as such, the risk of irreducibility or strangulation is low. 
And so the umbilical hernia does not need repairing until the age until persistence that may occur after the age of five, as 95% of hernias will close by that age. The hernias become obvious to their parents when the baby cries, as the intra-abdominal pressure increases and the bowel herniates through the defect. Here are some images that reflect the omphalocele with its avascular membrane and then the gastroschisis that is going para umbilically. As you can see here, the umbilical cord remains connected to the umbilicus. Now the hindgut is positioned as a result of these rotations described during formation of the midgut. However, the cloaca that we previously described inferiorly at the caudal end of the fetus needs to divide into a urogenital system and a hindgut system. The development of a urorectal canal will divide the cloaca into a dorsal anorectal canal and a ventral urogenital sinus. This ventral urogenital sinus will become the bladder, the pelvic urethra, and the phallic segment of the penis or clitoris. Clinically, this is important through the key anatomy and embryology surrounding the pectinate line. This line marks a division between the cranial two-thirds and the caudal one-third of the anorectal canal. Now, this is very interesting from an embryological perspective as this anatomical landmark marks a difference in the derivative, in the, in the primary germ layer derivative of the two tissues. Superior to the pectinate line is hindgut, whereas inferior to this line is skin. As such, it marks difference between endoderm superiorly and ectoderm inferiorly. The consequence of this is that this line also demarcates differences in vascular supplies and lymphatic drainage. Above the pectinate line, the inferior mesenteric arteries and its superior rectal arteries and veins supply the hindgut, whereas below the line, the internal iliac arteries and veins and the inferior rectal vessels supply the tissue. Furthermore, the lymphatic drainage differs such that superior to the line, drainage is to the paraaortic nodes, whereas inferior to the line, drainage occurs to the internal iliac um, lymphatics. This has consequences for any lesions, infections, or cancers, and the modality by which they spread. However, much more commonly, this anatomy and embryological difference is demonstrated through hemorrhoids. Tributaries will occur between the two vascular systems and where these the tributaries become engorged either due to high pressure through constipation or portal hypertension and hemorrhoids can occur. These present either with fresh PR bleeding on wiping or fresh PR bleeding in the toilet bowl. Furthermore, hemorrhoids can become thrombosed and painful. They can be managed conservatively with a change in diet, for example, a more fiber-containing diet, or medically through the application of topical cream. Alternatively, they can be removed in a hemorrhoidectomy or ligatured with banding. Much earlier, and in the last session, we described how the enteric nervous system is a derivative of the neural crest cells of the ectoderm. Now, if these neural crest cells fail to migrate, there is no enteric plexus. And this lack of innovation leads to a lack of peristalsis and coordinated muscle contraction. As a result, the muscle in the gut tube will hypertrophy as it begins to contract with an uncoordinated stimulus. This is often diagnosed shortly after birth with a megacolon or failure to pass the first fecal movement, the meconium. Despite the 
fetus not feeding in utero, there will be waste tissue within its GI tract following cellular shedding and also population with other cells and the biome. Now, as there is no peristalsis to lead to this first meconium, this first stool, the stool builds up intra-abdominally and this may be presented clinically through a distended abdomen. With any patient, regardless of age, that has constipation and or a distended abdomen and or pathology intra-abdominally that you are concerned about, it is pertinent to undergo a digital rectal examination. In the newborns, when this is done, this relieves the pressure in the gut and leads to an explosion of stool. The hypertrophy, in my mind, occurs due to the lack of coordinated movement and as such the repetitive contraction of the gut muscle. Much like any other muscle in the human body, repetitive contraction leads to growth. However, this hypertrophy will inadvertently also narrow the orifice of the gut tube. This is better demonstrated in infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Due to the abnormal innervation of the pyloric sphincter, there is hypertrophy at the outflow aspect of the stomach. This causes a gastric outlet obstruction. As such, every time the baby feeds, it will begin to vomit. Pathognomonic and typical of this condition is projectile vomiting, as the baby will be able to exert enough force to vomit the uh, milk across the room. And thank you very much. That last fun fact uh, marks the end of the course. I hope you've enjoyed um, learning a bit about embryology and I hope that doing so in less than two hours will reassure you for your exams and gives you some key bits of clinical knowledge that you can carry forward to pass your exams. I recall being a medical student and how stressful it was to balance the sheer volume of information that you need to process and learn and hopefully through learning these key high yield pieces of embryology that will relieve the burden on you slightly. I've put up one of my professional emails for you to contact me should you have any questions or want to find out more about embryology. Have a lovely day.